All right, the, the final uh, presentation uh, will be made by Harvey Mudd alumnus Tyrell McQueen. And uh, Tyrell is being recognized uh, for outstanding contributions to society uh, from his tech, science and technology accomplishments. Uh, Tyrell graduated from Harvey Mudd College in 2004, I get that right, yeah. <laughs> with a BS in uh, chemistry, and went on to earn both a MS in chemistry and a, uh, and a PhD in chemistry and materials. Uh, from Princeton University. Uh, Tyrell holds dual positions at John Hopkin, Hopkins University as an assistant professor of chemistry and a faculty member at the Institute for Quantum Matter in the development in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, this uh, sort of dual department arrangement allows Tyrell to design and synthesize new materials containing electrons that display emergent behaviors and then ex explore their physical properties on a level usually studied by condensed matter physicist. <clears throat> Tyrell's interdisciplinary uh, research has led to the discovery of new materials with unique physical properties, particularly those with strong electron correlation effects. The results of his research have already yielded 44 publications, two of which are in press, and over 1,200 citations and materials discovery in condensed matter physics. His accomplishments have been recognized by peers and experts in the field of quantum, chemi chem quantum chemistry as well. So please uh, join me in uh, uh, welcoming Terrell. Uh, to the Let's see if we can get this to work. I'm impressed. <laughs> that would be the generational thing. <laughs> so. Um, I, I hate standing at podiums, and I have to say, I, so I've given talks in a number of very nice places at this point in my life, um, and this is by far the most imposing uh, And And, you know, I, I, I've been uh, rather sort of blessed in the sense of winning a number of awards, uh, but when I got the email uh, about this one, um, it, it really meant a lot to me, as I, as I told my wife, who is also a mud alum, but unfortunately isn't here today, um, you know, it actually is probably the one that means the most to me. So th this is a very um, great thing, and I'm, I'm very honored to have it. Um, but, you know, since I'm sort of at the beginning of my career, I thought that rather than spend a lot of time talking about uh, the few things I've contributed so far, I thought I'd spend more, uh, just a few minutes talking about where I think things need to go. You know, in terms of, you know, where's the future? Where are we going with all of these things? And you know, I, I, I think this, um, this quote here from one of the newer Star Treks, it, it very accurately sort of conveys, you, you know, the idea. So you can be very optimistic about things, but it doesn't unfortunately change the laws of physics or things. But there might be ways around it. And that's the important thing. And so what am I, at the end of the day, I'm a materials chemist. And materials underlie everything you do, of course, you know this, you're, you're wearing clothes, you're sitting in chairs, right? I mean, uh, you know, the, the materials are all sorts of crazy things. But we heard a lot this morning about a number of wonderful things that have been done in the last 50 years because of the computer revolution. And there are many, 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 many important things that had to happen in order for the computer revolution to occur. And one of them was the development at the end of the day of the transistor. People in this audience remember far more than I do vacuum tubes, although I played with enough of them in my life. Transistors are much nicer things. Okay? All of these things are made possible because of our ability to do this. And this is something called zone refinement. So this is actually silicon. And this is molten. So this sort of caved in thing here, that is actually liquid silicon. That's solid, that's solid. And what you're doing is you're moving that molten zone up the rod, and as you do that, it purifies the silicon. That was developed at Bell Labs, and it means that we can make this material sufficiently well that it would actually be able to build a transistor. So that's the importance of materials. And so, I told you I'm sort of thinking about the future, not where we are, but you know, where are we going? And you know, from my perspective, there are really two really big materials challenges in the world today that have the potential to have wide-ranging impact. And one of them is how do we create highly structured materials? So
So this looks an awful lot like chalk. That's because it pretty much is chalk. It's actually not quite chalk, uh, it's, but it's a related mineral. It's a calcium phosphate hydroxide. And when you just make it sort of the way the Earth usually makes it, it's pretty much as flaky as chalk. Take that same material and structure it on all link scales. That is to say, not only do you have the right atomic structure, but you then pattern it at the nanoscale and the micro scale and then the millimeter scale, and you get bone. And bone's an amazing material in many ways. It's light, but strong. It bends, not brittle. Right? That all happens because of the structure across link scales. We'd love to be able to control this. And you know what? In some places, we do this. In steel making, we have 150 years of expertise in controlling this, but it's not through rational design that we've done it. It's through trying every possible combination of heating, cooling, this, that, and the other to find a set of conditions that does it. If we really want to make material useful, we should figure out how to do this in a controlled manner. But it's really hard, right? It's really hard. And here's what Pierrot mentioned with respect to strongly correlated electron materials. That probably meant nothing. But hopefully, you all like the idea of levitation. <laughs> that happens in this case. This is, this is a great picture, right, obviously. This sumo wrestler is, is standing on a magnet. And if I remember my Harvey Mudd physics education, levitation shouldn't be a stable thing. Okay, this I seem to recall. It's just static magnets, you shouldn't be able to do this. And it's true, with just static magnets, you can't. But what's actually underneath in this nice little package here is a liquid nitrogen cooled superconductor. And a superconductor is a remarkable material that carries an electrical current with zero resistance, and it, among other things, allows you to levitate things. You know, not to mention transporting power rather efficiently. Okay? That is an example of a strongly correlated electron behavior. And my re a lot of my research is trying to tackle this problem with the goal of making this kind of phenomena, which was totally unexpected when it was discovered 100 years ago, something we can actually control. So my talk has something for everyone in it. And if you like technical things, look on the left. If you like pretty pictures, look on the right. <laughs> okay? And so this is an example of us controlling the structure of a material at multiple length scales. Okay? This is actually just how we make the material at the end of the day. All my students learn glass blowing. This is an art that seems to be being lost these days. Um, but it turns out it's really useful in making materials to be able to, to make your own glassware and to seal things in it. And that's, so that's actually what that is. And there's really only sort of two things in the world you ever need to worry about. One is kinetics, and the other is thermodynamics. So thermodynamics is we wait a billion years and we're all, we're all carbon dioxide and water. And the world is done. <laughs> kinetics is that's why we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> That's why we're not all spontaneously combusting. Okay? So to control structure across link scales, this is what we do. We understand the various processes in their kinetics. And we understand how to use what are called catalysts to, mod to change the kinetics of some things, but not others. And through that, we are able to control what our materials do. And this is just the beginning. Because we're not just doing it for fun. We're doing it because of the physical problems. And so you know a theory is a good one. When it comes along and does two things. One, it provides an explanation and understanding of things we already know. And two, 
it then makes predictions that actually turn out to be right. And that happened maybe five years ago in this world of what I, what's now called topological materials. It's a fancy name. What is it? Well, I'll explain it with cars. So this is the flipper bridge. And what, what it does is it connects two places where in one place you drive on the left-hand side of the road. And on the other side, you drive on the right-hand side of the road. Now, either of those customs is fine. <laughs> the problem comes when you try to connect them. And in fact, what you'll decide is that no matter how hard you try, if you want to connect those two places, your bridge has to cross itself at least once, or three times, or five times, but it has to do it at least once. You can't get away with not doing it unless you want to have a whole bunch of car crashes. So these two places are what are called are topologically distinct. Mathematically, they fall into different topological classes. It turns out insulators, that is to say things that don't carry electricity. For a long time, we thought they were all the same at some very basic mathematical level. Turns out they're not. Turns out there's two kinds of them in three dimensions. And the unusual kind is this thing called a topological insulator. Here's an example of one material that was made by my group recently. Here's the data that shows we actually did it. Um, and any time you connect that topological insulator to a normal insulator, you get surfaces on this, you get states on the surface, just because of this kind of effect, that are metallic, they're spin polarized, and they behave like photons. Okay? So at least those motors in the audience who go up is because they've got a linear energy momentum relationship. They don't have the usual quadratic one that you'd expect for massive particles. That imparts, frankly, a huge number of remarkable properties, things we've been looking for for a long time in materials. Turns out they've been there for 50 years. The prototypical material for this is on every spacecraft that uses thermoelectric generators. It's been around for 50 years, and we never knew it. This phenomenon, by the way, also explains why IR sensors in our Mercury Telluride, why, was, why you can never really get rid of the, the bandwidth. There's a limitation of performance. Turns out this is why. And we try to make materials that do this. So this is what the material's life cycle, as I like to call it. And we've heard power today, so I thought, <laughs> sure, sure, I'll share this. So here's a cool plot. So this is colored. Blue is very abundant in Earth's crust. Red is good luck finding it. Um, well, things like radium, I think, are only in Earth's crust because of meteorite impacts or something, right? So th th there's a lot of variation. This is a plot on a log scale of what fraction of the elements in Earth's crust would you need? So this is a thousandth, a millionth, a billionth, a trillion. In order to convert one terawatt of power from one form to another. So this can be from heat to electricity, this can be from you know, electricity to light, I don't really care, it, they're all energy conversion processes, and the whole, for a whole bunch of different materials, and the point is you want to be a, use abundant things, so you tend to want to be over here. On the other hand, you don't want to lose all your energy when you do that, right? You want to actually get energy out of your device, we heard about that this morning too, so you want a high power conversion of so you really want to be all the way up here. And what this plot very nicely shows you is why natural gas, coal, nuclear, so on and so forth, are very good primary power sources. They are the ones that are able to, with a high conversion efficiency, using abundant elements, convert a lot of power. Okay? My group has been working on materials to try to land us up here. Turns out it's hard. <laughs> um, no, 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 I mean, the good news at some level is copper is not in the top five or six most abundant elements in Earth's crust. So there is actually, you know, a way to move this direction as long as you can keep the efficiency up, too. Okay? So this is an example of how, do you, how would you design, you know, what are the properties of the material I need in order to do what I want to do. And so why did I choose to 
to go to Johns Hopkins, which is where I am, rather than you know go and work at some company and do some great things, you know, maybe my own startup. Ooh, that video stopped, but it stopped at a great place. Um, so I, I, I teach freshmen independent research. So I teach a, a chemistry course to advanced freshmen who take basically years of general chemistry in their first semester, and then I've been teaching them inorganic chemistry in their second semester, and as part of that, they do their own projects. And they've done some pretty spectacular things, like blow up a pressurized bomb in the lab <laughs> and flood it with um, dimethyl sulfide, which smells like broccoli. Okay? Um, but they've done so in a safe manner. <laughs> and so, so that's what, what I consider something I learned very importantly from Mud, which is it's very important for students to be able to play, do, experiment, try, have things fail, because that's how you learn. And the responsibility is on me to make sure you can do that in a safe way. And at least that's what we're trying to do. We have this online pre-lecture system so they get to learn about things like symmetry before they come to class. Uh, this is what's called a thermal lance. You're used to cut down bridges in a night. Uh, basically, oxygen plus metal burns. Okay, that's what it is. You get it on the end of the stick. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. I'm just flashing the acknowledgments that these are the people I work with, people from all around the world these days. Um, people like to take pictures of some of the things we grow. Uh, my student's thumb will be forever famous <laughs> um, because we actually know how to work glass, which is sort of a rare thing. And again, I just thank you for your attention. And you know, maybe someday my kids, yeah. No. <laughs> thank you.